sometimes I've tried to, to break the kind of, uh, uh, what would you say, the sort of serious mood on the set, you know, the sort of importance of it all. Uh, and it builds up to that moment when the director says action, you know, and then cut, you know, with great authority. So at different times, uh, you know, and I think Clint Eastwood I read has gone through the same thing. I've not said those words. I did it particularly with, uh, on Dead Poets Society with young actors uh, who, who were a little nervous, you know, and so I would be irreverent, you know, and so at one period I said, look, well, the next few days we're not going to say action. Different you know, uh, signals will occur. So I said, the first one will be, I'm throwing this little piece of rolled up pa paper into the middle of the room. And when you see it touch the floor and settle, that's when you begin acting. And then I had some other way to have cut, you know, and, you know, of course, a bit silly, but they thought it was funny. You know, and I really would throw the paper out and they'd start acting. And, you know, and other times I'll, I'll uh, say, you know, if there's a stiffness in the air, I would say, well, get, let's just do this next tape with music playing, which ruins the sound, you know, but I'll, I'll put on some fantastic bit of, you know, music and jams out every sound. You can't hear the dialogue. And so for them, suddenly they're inside a movie, you know, it's, it's just breaking the rules. And, but most of the time you don't, you just do it the, you know, conventional way. But, but I do sometimes think it's good to have a, a way to break the, the ice, you know, uh, in this movie, uh, you have an extraordinary cast. Do you find yourself reacting to the actors' styles, or do they have to conform to your vision as a director? Well, firstly, there are multiple nationalities. Two Irish in, in Colin Farrell, Saoirse Ronan. Uh, two Romanians, um, and then Ed Harris, American. Uh, Skarsgård, Swedish. Uh, Jim Sturgis, English. So. The differences in their nationalities, I thought, was sort of served within whatever degree of differences that uh, they had in their technique. And uh, I think everybody knew that we were looking for something authentic. So everybody had gone and done their own research. Uh, I remember Gustav, who's playing a Latvian priest, you know, went, went over to Latvia and Riga and spent time there and found an old Bible in a, in a second-hand uh, shop and had his own story. Jim went to Poland. Uh, and then hung out with a with an SKP in London, an old Polish gentleman. So everybody had their own thing. So I try to create an atmosphere in which it's pretty clear the last thing I want from anybody is acting. Being, but not acting. But uh, Colin, you know, his wild ways are gone now. And he's, he said to me, I put all of that energy I used to waste into the part. With a film, you're living in the moment. And I think apart from... Uh, military action, there's very few occupations in which for a short intense period of time you are on the bow of the ship. You are living in the moment. There's no future and no past. Just this moment. Uh, and it's a big clock ticking. You know, you've got to get the day's work done. And you live vividly. Uh, and if the subject's right, I mean you can be in torment if the script isn't right or you've made a mistake with the casting. So you have to have got those things obviously under control. Otherwise, um, you know, you're, 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 your moment that you're living in is <laughs> purgatory. But that hasn't happened to me, I'm glad to say. Truman. <gasps> you can speak. I can hear you. Who are you? I am the creator of a television show that gives hope and joy and inspiration to millions. Then who am I? You are the star. You know, so there are subjects I can't go back to. Don't want to repeat myself. There's one thing worse than not working, and that is making the wrong film. Uh, because I think that could, if I did choose something just because I wanted to get to work, I think it could finish me off as a filmmaker. Um, now, of course, I guess you've been asked this a billion times, but um, the 2011 version of your particular take on what happened to the girls at Hamlin Road. <laughs> I didn't think you were going to say that. I'd be interested to see, like, after the, you know, the, t the passage of time, um, whether there's anything that comes back to you, scratches the back of your mind from time to time. Well, you know, I think I, I, think I left my answer in the film. Um, 
and I think it's the uh, it, yeah, well I know it is it's the Irishman in the story who who uh, is speculating on it and talking about the gossip about it and someone was seen sneaking around a pigsty or something and he says they might have fallen down a hole <laughs> it's such a powerful medium in a darkened theatre a lot of people you know particularly when you're starting out go more for shock and effect you know to knock you out as you go along I think you know you want to simplify it and in the end that it's just you know to build a film around a close-up you know which is the great invention of cinema forget 3D or CGI or even sound the great thing was that you could put a face up there so big and you can see the eyes you know so huge are the eyes windows to the soul I think it's pretty good maybe a bit more than just poetic uh, you can tell a lot about it, a person. I remember Gerard Depardieu saying to me in his old peasant way about somebody, he has the bad eye. <laughs> so there is something there. And this great invention, so, so young, not more than 100 years old, invented a way of putting a face up on a great size. And then when that face, what are they looking at? Are they looking at another face? Uh, are they looking at something else? You know, it is the dealing with the DNA of film.